Chapter 1. The Library in Middleford. Section A. What's this? It's a map. It's a map of England. This is a town. It's Middleford. This is a plan of Middleford. What's this? It's a church in Middleford. What's this? It's a hospital. It's a hospital in Middleford. This is a school. It's a school in Middleford. This is a supermarket. It's a supermarket in Middleford. This is a restaurant. It's a restaurant in Middleford. Section B. What's this? It's a library. We're in a library in Middleford. Are you Arthur? Yes, I am. I'm Arthur Newton. Who's she? Is she Mary? Yes, she is. She's Mary Stevens. Who's he? Is he Mr. Steele? Yes, he is. He's Mr. Steele. Mr. Steele, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Is Mary there? Yes, she's here. Is Arthur there? Yes, he's here. Section C. 1. This is a book. 2. Is this a table? Yes, it is. 3. What's this? Is it a clock? Yes, it is. 4. What's this? Is it a door? Yes, it is. It's a door. 5. What's this? Is it a window? Yes, it is. It's a window. 6. This is a light. 7. This is a desk. 8. This is a typewriter. 9. This is a pen. 10. This is a pencil. 11. This is a chair. 12. This is a telephone. 13. This is an umbrella. 14. This is an office. 15. This is a calendar. 16. This is a man. 17. This is a woman. 18. This is a boy. 19. This is a girl. 20. This is Mary. Uh, good morning, Mr. Steele. Ah, you're here, Arthur. Yes, I am. Good morning, Mary. Good morning, Arthur. How are you? Very well, thank you. And you? Fine, thanks. Starting out, ooh, ooh, starting out. Chapter 2. In the Kitchen. We aren't in the library now. We're with Arthur. He's at home with Mrs. Harrison. They're at 21 Gladstone Avenue, Middleford. 
It's a large house at the corner of the street. Gladstone Avenue is near the shops, but it isn't near the library. Where's Mrs. Harrison? She's in the kitchen. The window's open, and the door's closed. What's Mrs. Harrison like? Well, she isn't a young woman, and she isn't thin. She's quite old, and rather fat. There's a long table in the kitchen, with two chairs, and there's a cupboard on the wall. There's a cat under the table. What colour is it? It's black and white. It isn't beautiful. It's an ugly cat, with a short tail. Is there a fish on the table? No, there isn't. Is there a fish under the table with the cat? Yes, there is. The cat's happy. There are two cups and two saucers on the table. There's a milk jug and a teapot near the cups. There's a plate on the table, and there are four biscuits on the plate. Where's Arthur? Is he in the kitchen? No, he isn't. He's in the bathroom. Are you in the bathroom, Arthur? No, I'm not. I'm here. Ah,、oh, good evening, Arthur. Good evening, Mrs. Harrison.、Oh, what's that? This here. Yes. It's a bottle. Yes, I know. But what's in the bottle? Orange squash. Are you thirsty, Mrs. Harrison? Yes, I am. Thank you, Arthur. The glasses are on the shelf. Ah, uh, which glasses? These glasses here, or those glasses?、Uh, those in front of you. These blue glasses? No, not those. They're too small. These, the green glasses. Yes, those. That's right. Arthur, be careful. Oh dear. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> Where's the brush? It's in the cupboard on a hook. Ah、uh, yes, here it is. Ah, the glass is in the dustbin now. It isn't on the floor. What's for supper, Mrs. Harrison? You aren't hungry, are you? Yes, I am. <laughs> There's fish. It's on the table near the sink. Where? It isn't here. Where is it then? It isn't on the table, and it isn't in the fridge. No, it isn't here. Well, where is the fish? Chapter Three. Arthur in a restaurant. Well, there's no fish for Arthur at home tonight. Mrs. Harrison hasn't any food. Arthur isn't very happy. In fact, he is miserable. He is also very hungry. Near the library, there is a new restaurant. Arthur is now at a table in this restaurant. There is a red tablecloth on the table, and there are some knives, forks, and spoons, and some salt and pepper on the table. There are two empty glasses on the table. Arthur now has the menu. There are some very good things on the menu. The steak is very good. But it is also expensive. Arthur has only two pounds and ten pence. He hasn't any ten-pound notes or five-pound notes. Who are the people in the dark corner over there? They are Mary Stevens from the library, and Bruce Fanshawe. 
Mary is a pretty girl, and Bruce is good-looking. He has a moustache, and he has a gold watch. Yes, Bruce has some money tonight. Bruce and Mary have some white wine on the table. Arthur hasn't a gold watch. He has only a cheap watch. Arthur hasn't any wine because he hasn't any money. Good evening, sir. Ah, one omelette, please, and some bread and butter. Any vegetables, sir? Uh, no, thank you. Any wine, sir? No, thanks. Very good. Who's that over there? Ah, oh, it's Mary. Who's that with Mary? Uh, it's Bruce. Mary's very pretty tonight. She's a very nice girl. What have they got? Oh, they've got wine, and I've got water. I haven't got any money. Bruce has got lots of money. One omelette for you, sir. Thank you. Uh, excuse me, I haven't got any bread and butter. Wait a moment, sir. Wait up! Sir. This bottle's empty. We haven't got any wine now. Have you got a full one? Certainly, sir. Immediately. Um, some bread, please, waiter. One moment. Ah, good. Here's the wine. Oh, and these potatoes aren't hot. They're cold. Sorry, sir. I, I, I haven't got any bread and butter. One moment. Oh, Bruce. This is a marvellous meal. Yes, it's not bad, is it? Ah, thank you, waiter. Yes, these potatoes are hot. Have some wine, Mary. Mm. Uh, bread, please, waiter. Here you are. Oh, dear. Now the omelette's cold and the water's warm. Waiter! Yes, what is it? This water's warm. Have you got any ice? Yes, one moment. Oh, Bruce. Hmm? There's Arthur. Who's Arthur? Arthur from the library. He's over there. Oh, Arthur. Ah, here's the bill. Thank you, waiter. Oh, dear. One omelette, one pound forty. Bread and butter, thirty p. Cover charge, thirty five p. Service, ten per cent. That's twenty p. That's two pounds twenty five altogether. And I've only got two pounds ten. <coughs> uh, excuse me, Mary. Yes, sir. I'm very sorry, but... You're um, very sorry? Why? Uh, well, I've got a bill for £2.25, and uh, I've only got £2.10. Uh, Here's a pound. Good night, Arthur. Chapter 4. The Wrong House Well, not a very good evening for Arthur. Now he is at the bus stop on a cold evening. He is tired, cold and miserable. His hands are cold, his feet are cold and he has a red nose. Where are Bruce and Mary? Perhaps they're still at the restaurant with a nice hot cup of coffee and some brandy. Their hands and feet are not cold. But, of course, Bruce has some money. His wallet is not empty, like Arthur's. He has one or two five-pound notes in his pocket. Perhaps they are in Bruce's car, or perhaps... But here is Arthur's bus. That's good. 
Now Arthur is in the bus, but his hands and feet are still cold. There are only two or three people in the bus with Arthur. There is an old lady with a handbag and a small dog on her knee. And there are two men with pipes in their mouths. There are no other people in the bus, only the conductor and the driver, of course. Now Arthur is at the front door of his house. Where is his key? Is it in his coat pocket? No, it isn't. Is it in his trousers pocket? No, it isn't there either. This is bad. There are no lights in the house. Mrs. Harrison is probably asleep. She is also deaf. Where's the bell? Ah, here it is. Come on, Mrs. Harrison, open the door. Oh, no, she's asleep or deaf. Well, there's a ladder in the garden at the back of the house. Ah, but is my bedroom window open? Yes, it is. Now, for the ladder. Good. Here's the ladder. Yes. Okay. Hey, you. What? Me? Yes, you. Come down. Oh God. What's the meaning of this? Well, I haven't got my key, and so... This is my house. Well, not mine, really. It's Mrs. Harrison's. First it's your house, then it's Mrs. Harrison's. Now, once again, whose house is it? Is it yours or hers? It's not mine. It's Mrs. Harrison's. I have a room here. Is there a bell? Yes, of course. Well, ring it. It's no good. Mrs. Harrison's asleep. I see. Whose is this ladder? Is it yours? No, it isn't mine. This Mrs. Harrison. Is it hers? Perhaps it is. There's always a ladder at the back of the house. Come into our car, sir. But why? Because it's cold out here. <sighs> I see. Close the door, sir. Now, what's your name? Um, Newton. Uh, Arthur Newton. And your address? My address? Here, of course. That's why... Uh, once again, your address, please. Oh, very well. It's 21 Gladstone Avenue, Middleford. Is that OK? I'm tired and my bed's just up there, up that ladder. No, it's not all right. This is Disraeli Avenue. Gladstone Avenue's the next street. Oh. Chapter 5 Arthur's Dream It's Sunday afternoon. It's raining. Arthur's sitting in an armchair in Mrs. Harrison's sitting room. He's thinking. He isn't happy. He's miserable. The television's on. 
but Arthur isn't watching it. What is he thinking about? He's thinking about Mary. What's she doing this afternoon? She isn't sitting at home, and she isn't watching television. She's sitting next to Bruce in his car. They're driving into the country. Arthur isn't driving with Mary. He hasn't got a car, and he hasn't got any money. Now Mrs. Harrison's walking into the sitting room. What's she carrying? She's carrying a tray. What's on the tray? There are two cups of coffee. One for Arthur and one for Mrs. Harrison. Now the coffee's on the arm of Arthur's chair, but he isn't drinking it. Arthur's sleeping. He's dreaming. What is he dreaming about? He's dreaming about Mary. In his dream, Arthur's got a car. Bruce isn't driving the car. Arthur is. Arthur's driving the car, and Mary's sitting next to Arthur. She isn't sitting with Bruce. Arthur and Mary are going to the seaside together. It isn't raining now. The sun's shining and the birds are singing. It's a beautiful day, and Arthur's happy. Now Arthur and Mary are lying on the beach. Arthur's wearing a pair of swimming trunks, and Mary's wearing a bikini. Mary's eating an ice cream, and Arthur's smoking a cigarette. Bruce isn't lying on the beach with Mary. Arthur is. Look at all those people, Mary. They're swimming in the sea. Oh, it's a beautiful day. Yeah. It's a lovely day. The water's warm, the sun's shining, and I'm very happy. Oh, I'm happy too, Mary. We're together, and we're lying on this lovely beach. I've got the radio here, Arthur. Good. Switch it on. And the next postcard's from Arthur Newton of 21 Gladstone Avenue, Middleford. So we're playing this record for Arthur and his girlfriend, Mary Stevens. Arthur and Mary are librarians in Middleford. Happy days, Arthur and Mary. Setting the trends, making friends, each day ends like the last. Hitting the heights, the right Listen, Mary, they're playing our song. Oh, Arthur, you are sweet. <laughs> oh, look, some children are playing cricket over there, on the sand near the sea. Oh, yes. That boy with the red hair is hitting the ball very hard. Now that little blonde girl's running into the sea. Oh, dear. She isn't coming back. Good heavens, she's drowning. Oh, my God. And Arthur's going in. Oh, dear, my Helen's drowning. No, oh. she, she isn't. Look, Arthur's carrying your child on his back. Oh. He's coming out of the water now. Is she all right? Yes. She's okay. She's unconscious, but she's breathing. Oh, thank you, young man. Oh, it's nothing at all. Look, she's opening her eyes. Mummy, where am I? You're all right now, darling. Thanks to this young man. Oh, Arthur, you're so brave. I've got a wonderful boyfriend. You're wonderful too, Mary. You're wonderful. Am I really wonderful, Arthur? Oh. Well, you aren't drinking my coffee. Oh, dear. Starting out, ooh, you, starting out. Chapter 6. Danger, Arthur at work. 
It is Friday morning. Arthur is in the library. Mary is also there with him. She is sitting at her desk and talking to a man. He is giving her a book, and she is stamping the date on it. Where is Arthur? He is at the top of the ladder. He has some books in his hand. They are new books. He is putting them on the top shelves. Is Mr. Steele in the library? No, he is in his office. A woman is with him, and he is talking to her. Now Arthur is taking some books from a box. He is giving them to Mary. She is writing the titles of the books on a card. Arthur is climbing the ladder again. This is hard work for him. He is tired. Now he is sitting at the top of the ladder. The book in his hand is interesting, so he is reading it. Ah, Mary, that's good. You're getting those new books ready. Yes, that's right. And Arthur's putting them on the shelves. Show me some of them, please. Here you are, Mr. Steele. Thank you. Ah, a new history of Middleford by Thomas Skinner. Very interesting. Ah, here's a good book for Arthur. King Arthur by Richard Watkins. <laughs> They're sending us another box of books tomorrow. Oh, are they? That's good. By the way, Arthur's very quiet, isn't he? Where is he? He's up the ladder behind one of those shelves. Oh, he's working, you see. That's a nice change. Yes. Arthur, what are you doing? He isn't answering me. Are you sure he's there? He isn't across the road in the sunny snack bar, is he? He isn't there drinking a cup of coffee. Oh, hmm? no, Mr. Steele. Well, I'm going to see him. Mary, come here. Coming, Mr. Steele. Look at him. He's sitting at the top of that ladder. He's got a book in his hand, and he's reading it. Arthur, what are you doing? Is that book interesting? What? Oh! oh! <laughs> Silence in the library, Arthur. Chapter 7 Arthur is late for work. Arthur's bedroom is between Mrs. Harrison's bedroom and the bathroom. These three rooms are upstairs. The kitchen, the sitting room and the dining room are downstairs. There are two lavatories, one upstairs and one downstairs. It is half past eight on Monday morning and Mrs. Harrison is downstairs. She is standing in front of the stove, and she is making breakfast. Arthur isn't downstairs. He is asleep in bed. It is now a quarter to nine, and Mrs. Harrison is going upstairs. Arthur is late, and Mrs. Harrison must wake him up. Can you hear me, Arthur? You must get up. She is calling to him. Arthur is lazy. He cannot get up in the morning. He has an alarm clock, but he cannot hear it. It is now nine o'clock. Arthur is getting out of bed. He is wearing his pyjamas. He is looking for his socks, but he cannot find them. I must find them, he is thinking. Where are they? They aren't under the bed, and they aren't on the chair. Where are Arthur's socks? Now it's five past nine. Arthur is downstairs. 
He cannot drink his tea. It is too hot. He cannot have breakfast. He is very late. He must go to work immediately. It is now a quarter past nine. Arthur is standing at the bus stop. He is waiting for the bus. He cannot see the bus because he is reading the newspaper. Oh dear, the bus is not stopping. There isn't another bus until half past nine. Arthur must walk. He must walk quickly. He must not walk slowly. Now it is twenty to ten. Arthur is looking through the library window. Mary is there. He can see her through the window, but he cannot see Mr. Steele. That is good. Mr. Steele must not see him at this time. Gosh, Arthur, you are late. What's the time then? It's nearly ten to ten. My God, is it really? Where's Mr. Steele? Is he in? Yes, he's in his office. Arthur, you aren't wearing a tie. Oh, you must wear a tie in the library. You can't possibly come to work without one. Yes, you're right. I can't. What can I do? Tell me. Mr. Steele mustn't see you. He can't see us now. His door's closed and he's talking on the telephone. You must go quickly. I can't do that. Yes, you must. You must telephone Mr. Steele and say you've got a headache. But I haven't got a headache. Oh, Arthur, you are stupid. Go on now, quickly. Oh, but I haven't got a five p coin for the telephone. I can't telephone without one. Oh, Arthur, where's my handbag? Oh dear, I can't find it. Oh, oh good. Here it is. Uh, there you are, Arthur. Now you can telephone. Now go. You mustn't stay here another minute. No. What must I do? I must、uh, find a telephone box. Good. There's a phone box opposite here, across the road.、Oh, but Arthur. Oh. Hello, Mary. Is Arthur here? Oh, look at the time. It's five past ten. He's an hour late. No, he isn't here. He is late, isn't he? Yes, he is. He's late every day. But it's very late now. Perhaps he's ill. Then he must telephone. I... Answer the phone, please, Mary. Very good, Mr. Steele. Middleford Central Library. Can I help you? Oh, hello, Arthur. Oh, I'm sorry. Is it bad? Mr. Steele, Arthur has a headache and he can't come to work. Give me the phone, Mary. Is that you, Arthur? What? You're at home and you've got a headache. I see. Well, tell me this then: Who can I see in the phone box across the road? Is it your twin brother? Chapter Eight, stuck on the station. In fact, Arthur has no twin brother, but he has a father, a mother, and a teenage sister, Jennifer. Arthur's father is a doctor in a village in Berkshire called Applefield. It's a small place with not many people, and it's only a few miles from Reading. Arthur's parents have a small house between the church and the village pub. It's Thursday morning in Middleford, and Arthur's in the kitchen. He isn't late today; he's early. This morning he has time for breakfast. It's only half past seven, and so he can have a lot of things for breakfast. Now Mrs. Harrison's bringing in the post. There aren't many letters this morning. There are only two, one for Mrs. Harrison, and one for Arthur. Arthur's letter is from his parents. There's a party at Arthur's parents' house on Saturday. It's Jennifer's birthday, and she's seventeen, so Arthur must go home for the weekend. Arthur is now taking his wallet out of his pocket. 
How much money is there in it? There isn't very much. In fact, there's very little. How much is the fare to Applefield? It's two pounds twenty return, and one pound ten single. He must pay Mrs. Harrison, and he must pay about three pounds for Jennifer's birthday present. Arthur is at the booking office at Middleford Town Station. Um, a single to Applefield, please. How much is that? It's one pound ten. Which platform is it? It's platform four. You must change at Reading. Thanks very much. Goodbye. Hey, you change. Oh, sorry. Thanks a lot. Oh dear, this train's full. I can't find an empty seat at all. There aren't any seats in this compartment, and there aren't any in this one either. And this one's full too. Oh. I must try the next carriage. Ah, this one isn't too bad. And this compartment's almost empty. There's only one girl in it. Um, excuse me. Is the seat free? No, I'm afraid not. That's my friend's seat.、Oh. But there's lots of room here. All these seats are free. Oh, good. Um, by the way, this is the Reading train, isn't it? That's right. My friend and I are going there. Oh, here she is. Mary, what are you doing here? Oh, hello, Arthur. This is my friend Sheila. We're going to her aunt's in Applefield. Well, isn't that funny? I'm going there too. My father's the doctor there, actually. It's my sister's birthday tomorrow. Oh, how many brothers and sisters have you got? Only Jennifer. I haven't got any brothers. Ah, good. The train's leaving now. That's good. How many stops are there before Reading? Oh, there aren't many. There are only a few because this is a fast train. But there are a lot of stops on the one from Reading to Applefield. Is there a buffet car on this train, Arthur? No, there isn't one on this train, unfortunately. Oh, isn't there?、Mm. Oh dear, I must have a cup of tea soon. Yes, I'm thirsty too. Look, we're stopping. And there's a buffet on the platform.、Mm. Arthur. Yes. We must have some tea. Oh, must I go? Oh, all right. Sugar? Not for me, but lots for Sheila. Now Arthur is at the buffet on the platform. Three teas, please.、Uh, Can you hurry, please? I've only got one pair of hands. Oh God! The train's leaving, and my bag's on the train, my coat's on the train, and my ticket's in my overcoat pocket. And here are your teas. Chapter Nine, Jennifer's birthday party. Poor Arthur, he has three cups of tea, and he doesn't like tea very much. Poor Sheila and Mary, they like tea, and they haven't got any. Now Arthur is talking to the porter. What time is the next train? The next one's in an hour. After a miserable journey, Arthur is now at home in Applefield. It is Saturday evening, and Jennifer is welcoming her guests to her party. Like many young girls today, Jennifer and her friends often wear jeans and sweaters at parties. They don't always wear pretty dresses. There is a record on the record player. Young people usually listen to records. Dance 
and, of course, eat and drink at parties. Arthur's parents, Dr. and Mrs. Newton, are not here this evening. They don't like young people's parties very much. They are having dinner with their friends, Mr. and Mrs. Lester. Mr. Lester works for a large engineering firm in London. Now Sheila is coming in, and, yes, Mary is with her. Jennifer knows Sheila because she often comes to Applefield. But Mary doesn't know any of the people here except Sheila and, of course, Arthur. Hello, Jennifer. Hello, Bob. Nice to see you. Is that for me? What is it? Oh, open it and see. Happy birthday, Jennifer. Thanks. Oh, look, it's a necklace. That's very kind of you, Bob. Do you know my brother, Arthur? Uh, no. Hello, Arthur. What do you do? Well, I work in a library in Middleford. Oh. Have you got a flat there? No. I live in Diggs. I don't like it very much. My landlady, Mrs. Harrison, cooks awful meals. I only eat good food here. My mother's a good cook. What do you do? I'm a student. I'm at Reading University. Oh. Hello, Arthur. I don't know many people here. Who are you talking to? Oh, hello, Mary. This is Bob. Bob, this is Mary. Uh, hello. Where do you come from? Uh, excuse me a minute. Jennifer wants me. Arthur, say thank you to Sheila. She's got your bag and your overcoat. Oh, thank goodness. That's nice of you, Sheila. Where's my cup of tea, Arthur? Oh, no. I don't <laughs> want to hear the words cup of tea again. Yes, poor Arthur. I am sorry. <laughs> So, your aunt and uncle live in Applefield, do they? What's their name? It's Dawson. Ah, I think I know them. Does your uncle play cricket for the local team? Yes, that's right. Hmm, I sometimes see him in the summer. He plays quite well. Oh! <laughs> Jennifer! Telephone! Coming! Applefield 5234? Yes. No, he's out. What? Oh dear, he's at Mr. and Mrs. Lester's. Yes, I've got the number here. It's Applefield 3972. Arthur, come here! There's an accident up the road. They must have a doctor. Starting out, ooh, ooh, starting out. Chapter 10. A Road Accident. Dr. Newton is in the dining room at the Lester's. Mrs. Newton is with him. They are having coffee after an excellent meal. Now the telephone is ringing, and Mr. Lester is getting up from the table. He's going to answer it. Dr. Newton is just going to have another cup of coffee, but Mr. Lester is saying... It's somebody for you, Jack. It's the police. There's an accident at the crossroads near the school. Dr. Newton is now putting on his coat. In a minute, he's going to get into his car and drive to the scene of the accident. Mrs. Newton isn't going to go with him. Mr. Lester is going to drive her home later. Now Dr. Newton is standing by his car. He's going to take his black bag out. He must check the contents, because he must have a number of things like bandages, dressings, syringes, and various medicines. Now Dr. Newton is going back into the house. He's going to telephone Arthur because he wants something from the surgery. He's going to ask Arthur to bring some penicillin to the scene of the accident. Can you see anything? Is it a bad accident? Oh, somebody's standing in front of me. 
I can't see anything. There's a young man in the car. There's nobody with him. Stand back, everybody, please. There's nothing to see. You, sir, stand back. Don't come anywhere near the car, please. There's petrol everywhere. It's me. I'm Dr. Oh, it's you, Dr. Newton. Sorry. There's a young man. He's unconscious. The ambulance is going to be here soon. It's coming from Reading. Somebody's going to the car now. It's Dr. Newton. Is my son Arthur here? Uh, no, I don't think so. Well, he's going to bring something for me from the surgery in a minute or two. Are you going to take him out of the car now, Doctor? No, I'm going to examine him first. Can you hold this torch for me? Uh, yes, of course. Now, do go home, all of you, please. Haven't you got anywhere to go? Now, can you shine the torch on my watch, please? I'm going to take his pulse. Hmm. Yes. Now, can somebody give me my bag? Ah, uh, here you are, Doctor. Uh. Now, I'm just going to check for any fractures. Yes. His legs are okay. Ah. Uh, ah. Uh, two of his ribs are fractured. Is he going to be all right? Yes, I think so. It's nothing serious. He must spend some time in hospital, of course. Oh, there you are, Arthur. Have you got everything? Yes. Here it is. Well, give it to me, then. Don't just stand there. All right. Good Lord. I know that car. What? I know that car, and I know the driver. Well, he isn't anybody from the village. Who is he, then? Chapter 11. Sunday morning in Applefield. Arthur has seen the car and the driver, and he has recognized both of them. Who has Arthur recognized? Yes, you are right. It's Bruce Fanshaw, the Casanova of Middleford. Dr. Newton has examined his patient. And now he is in the ambulance on his way to Applefield Hospital. He's going to stay there for a few days. A breakdown lorry has arrived from the local garage and is going to take Bruce's car away. The policeman has written down Bruce's name and address and he has looked at his driving license and insurance certificate. Dr. Newton and Arthur have driven back home now the party has finished. Jennifer has said goodbye to her guests, and all of them have gone home. Mrs. Newton has just arrived home, and she is going upstairs to bed. Jennifer is still up. She's taking all the dirty glasses and plates into the kitchen, and she's going to do the washing up in a minute. She has put all the records away and tidied the sitting room. Now it's eleven o'clock on Sunday morning. All the Newtons have got up and have had their breakfast. Arthur has just telephoned Mary and Sheila and told them about Bruce. Doctor and Mrs. Newton have both gone to church. Neither Arthur nor Jennifer has gone because Jennifer is cleaning the house and Arthur is too lazy. He has not even had a shave. He has asked both Mary and Sheila to meet him in the Applefield Arms, the village pub, at twelve o'clock. Oh, Arthur, look at the time. It's twenty to twelve and you haven't had a shave. You've been in that armchair all the morning reading the news of the world 
And I've done all the cleaning. And I've done all the vegetables. I've put the meat into the oven. And I've had a bath. Come on, get ready. We're going to meet Sheila and Mary in a quarter of an hour. Oh, shut up, Jennifer. I'm reading the paper. It only takes me a couple of minutes to get ready. Ah, here, I say. What are you doing with that paper? Give it back. You can read it after lunch. Now hurry up. Don't you want to see Mary? Oh, he's gone up to the bathroom at last. Hello, Jennifer. Hello, Arthur. Thanks for the lovely party. Oh, I say, it's bad news about Bruce. Mary's gone to the hospital, so she's going to be a bit late. And we're a bit late too, thanks to Arthur. Oh. Now none of the seats are free and neither of us can sit down. You can have my seat. No, sit down, Sheila. Arthur! What? Neither Sheila nor I have got a drink. Are we going to stand here all day without one? There are a lot of people at the bar. Can we wait a minute? No, we can't. All that work in the house has made me thirsty. All right, I'm going. Arthur, come back. What is it now? You haven't asked either of us. Oh, dear, I'm sorry. Sheila, what do you want to drink? Oh, just a sweet sherry for me, please. And I'm going to have a tomato juice. That's a sweet sherry... A tomato juice and a half of bitter for me. Oh, dear. I say, Jennifer. Well? Can you lend me a couple of pounds? Oh. Chapter 12. In Trouble with Mr. Steele. It's Monday morning. Arthur and Mary have already gone back to Middleford. Sheila hasn't returned yet. She is still in Applefield with her aunt. She's going to go back to Middleford in a couple of days. Bruce, of course, is still in hospital. Mary and Arthur are once again in the library. It's ten o'clock. Arthur has been there since ten past nine. He still can't get there at nine o'clock. Mary has been at the library since five to nine. She has been there for over an hour. She is always early for work. Mr. Steele has not yet come to work. He's the boss, so he sometimes comes late, but he often stays late. Sometimes he is still there at seven or eight in the evening. Arthur has a lot of work on his desk. He must send some postcards to the readers. They have ordered some special books, and these books have already come into the library. He has already sent a few of the postcards, but there are still a lot on his desk. He hasn't sent any for several days. Now Mr. Steele has just come in. He hasn't gone into his office yet, He's still standing near the door. Good morning, Mary. Good morning, Arthur. Have you had a good weekend? Yes, yes. thank you. Thank you, Mr. Steele. Have there been any telephone messages for me yet? Um, no, there haven't been any calls. Good. Now, what have you done this morning, Mary? Well, I've already taken the old magazines away from the reference section... But I haven't put the new ones out yet. Ah, good. Now, Arthur, how long have you been here? Have you been here since nine o'clock? Yes, Mr. Steele. I've been here since nine. Well, perhaps five past. Mm -hmm. And what have you done this morning? Have you finished those postcards yet? Well, I haven't finished all of them yet. I've still got two or three of them to do. But you've still got all those on your desk over there. Haven't you done them yet? You mean these? Hmm. Well, I haven't had time... But you've had them for a week, or nearly a week. I've had them since last Wednesday, actually. Well, that's nearly a week. Come into my office for a minute. Uh, no, 
Wait a moment. <clears throat> Somebody's coming. Has my copy of A History of Knitting come in yet? I've waited six weeks for it. Well, just a minute, madam. Well, yes, as a matter of fact, it's been here for over a fortnight. Well, you haven't sent me a postcard. You usually do. Arthur, you come into my office at once. Starting out, ooh, ooh, starting out. Chapter 13. A Summer's Evening in June. Last weekend in Applefield, Arthur was broke. It was the end of the month. But on the last Thursday of each month, Arthur gets his pay. And today is Thursday, the 27th of June. It's payday, and Arthur's happy. The weather's fine and warm, and Mr. Steele is going to start his holiday on Monday the 1st of July. He's going to be away until the 15th of July. Arthur is happy about this, too. So Arthur's going to have some money this weekend. Mary's not going to go out with Bruce. He's still in hospital. His injuries weren't serious, but the doctors have not allowed him to get up. He's going to stay in hospital for another ten days. Again, Arthur's happy about this. Last weekend wasn't a great success for Arthur, but this week is going to be different. Arthur hopes. The summer weather is good. It hasn't rained for three weeks, and the sun has shone all day today. Now it's a beautiful evening. It's not dark yet. The summer evenings are always light. Mr. Steele has just gone home. Arthur's locking the library doors, and Mary's finishing her last letter. She's wearing a light summer dress, and is looking very pretty. Have you locked up, Arthur? Yes, I've just done it. Oh, we can go home now, can't we? It was a busy day today, wasn't it? There were a lot of people in. I'm only going to be a few minutes. I've just got this one letter. I've nearly finished it. There were a lot of letters yesterday, but I haven't had so many today. That's all right. I'm in no hurry at all. Um, I say, Mary, look, actually, um, well, are you doing anything this evening? No, I'm not, as a matter of fact. Why? Well, it's a lovely evening, isn't it? Perhaps we can have a meal or something. It is payday, isn't it? Well, what's the time? It's seven o'clock. Hmm, I don't know. Oh, come on, Mary. We can go to that restaurant by the river. It's lovely at this time of the year. We can sit outside. I expect it's still quite warm. Oh, all right. But I mustn't be too late. Oh, great. <laughs> we must both work tomorrow, mustn't we? I'm just going to give my mother a ring. That wasn't a bad meal, was it? No, it was lovely. That was very nice of you, Arthur. Now I really must go home. Oh, it's only ten o'clock. No, really, Arthur, I must be off. Well, look, Mary, what about Saturday? Would you like to come out with me on Saturday? We can go down the river on a boat and have a picnic, can't we? Saturday? That's the 29th, isn't it? Mm. Let's see. Here's my diary. Saturday, the 29th of June. Bruce. Well, he's in hospital, isn't he? <laughs> yes, all right, then. Oh, lovely. Let's meet outside the town hall at two o'clock, then. Yes, that's all right. Oh, look. There's Sheila and her brother Michael. Hey, Sheila. Hello, you two. Arthur, you haven't met my brother Michael, have you? Uh, no, actually. How do you do? Hello. Look, Arthur and I are going on the river on Saturday. Mm. Would you two like to come as well? That's well, a good idea. What do you think, Michael? Yes, lovely. <gasps> Look, Mary, we're going to catch the 1015 bus now. There isn't another one for half an hour. Are you coming with us? Yes, that's a good idea. Bye-bye, Arthur. 
Thanks for a lovely evening. See you tomorrow. Oh, hell. Starting out. Ooh, ooh, starting out. Chapter 14. On the River. Arthur got up early on Saturday morning. He had a shave and put his clothes on. He doesn't put his suit on when he isn't working. He opened his drawer and took out his light-coloured trousers. He put his suit on a hanger and hung it up in the wardrobe and then closed the wardrobe door. He went downstairs and switched on the radio. He wanted to hear the weather forecast. What was the weather going to be like? The forecast was good. Sunshine, clear skies and high temperatures. Arthur was pleased about this. Then he switched the radio off and went into the kitchen for breakfast. After breakfast, he rang Mary up. He told her the forecast was good and asked her about the food for the picnic. She asked him to do the shopping because she was busy. So Arthur went to the supermarket and bought some cheese, ham and tomato sandwiches, some pickled onions and some fruit. After that, he went to the off-license and bought some drinks. This weekend, of course, he had enough money for all these things. Usually, he is too broke. At two o'clock sharp, Arthur got off the bus outside the town hall. He had his bag with him, with the sandwiches, drinks, and the rest of the food. The others were not there yet. Arthur was the first. It was a very hot afternoon. After about three minutes, Sheila and Michael arrived. Michael had a picnic basket with a cold chicken in it, some French bread and a bottle of wine. They waited for another two minutes and then Mary appeared. She looked very beautiful. They all walked down to the bridge and hired a boat for the afternoon. Who's going to row? I can row first, if you like. All right, then I can steer. Yes. And you can sit in the front with me, Arthur. Mm. Which way are we going? Let's go downstream to the island, the one with the trees on it. We can have our picnic there. It isn't too far. Have you got enough room, Sheila? It isn't too uncomfortable for you, is it? No, there's plenty of room for us both here, isn't there? Mm. The seat's quite wide enough. <laughs> I'm not too big, am I, Arthur? No, I suppose not. Everybody comfortable? Mm. Right, off we go. <laughs> what are those sandwiches like? Very nice. Would you like one? Oh, yes, please. Thanks. Do you want some pickled onions? Are there any? Yes, there are some over there. Have another sandwich, Arthur. No, thanks. I've got one already. What about some wine, then? I've got enough here, thanks. Mm. What about Mary, Sheila? And me? We'd like some. Oh, haven't you got any? Oh, sorry. Uh, here, pass your glasses over. There you are. Thanks. Thanks. Have you been here before, Mary? Yes. I came here a fortnight ago, actually. Oh, it's getting a little chilly now, I think. Yes, it is. Mm. I'm not really warm enough. Here, take my sweater. Oh, thank you. Perhaps it's time to go back now. It's a bit cloudy, too, isn't it? Yes. I think it's going to rain soon. Yes, let's go. Hey, where's the boat? Who tied it up? It was you, Arthur, wasn't it? Uh, yes. I'm sorry. Look, there it is, on the other side of the river. Oh, never mind, Arthur.
Chapter 15 Learning to Drive Two small boys in a canoe brought the boat back to the island after about three quarters of an hour and Arthur rowed the boat back to the bridge. He didn't row very quickly because this time it was upstream and Arthur wasn't very good at rowing anyway. Sheila steered and Mary sat next to Michael. They arrived back at the bridge by eight o'clock. Because they were all wet and miserable, they went home immediately. Mary didn't even say good night to Arthur. When Arthur got home, he went straight to bed. The following morning, it was still wet, so Arthur didn't get up until twelve o'clock. Then he had lunch and sat in front of the television for the rest of the day. He didn't go out, and he didn't even have a shave. One of the programs on the television was about learning to drive. What a good idea, Arthur thought. And so the next day, he went along to the license office in his lunch hour and got a provisional driving license. Then he went to the driving school and made an appointment for his first lesson on Wednesday evening. Good evening. My name's Newton. I've come for my driving lesson. Uh, sorry, what was your name again? Arthur Newton. Uh, he he here's the card. You gave it to me on Monday. Oh, yes, that's right, Mr. Newton. I remember now. Did you get your license, by the way? Yes. Um, here it is. Good, that's fine. Do sit down for a minute. Mr. Taylor, your instructor is out with another pupil at the moment. You're a bit early, actually. Ah, that's him now. My God, Elsie. I had a terrible time with Mrs. Uh, What's-her-name. She nearly drove the car into a brick wall just now. Is my hair completely white? Ah. Oh, uh, hello. This is your new pupil, Mr. Taylor. Mr. Taylor, Mr. Newton. Uh, how do you do, Mr. Newton? Have you ever driven before? Well, I had some lessons from my father once, but after a few lessons, he refused to continue. Oh, I see. <clears throat> well, are you ready then? Let's go. Now then, did you ever learn about the controls? Yes, I did. But uh, I think I've forgotten them now. Well, uh, anyway, this is the steering wheel, as you know. And these pedals are the clutch on the left here, mm -hmm. and that's for your left foot. Oh. Uh, the middle one's the foot brake, and the one on the right's the accelerator. Uh, you use your right foot for both the brake and the accelerator. This is the handbrake, and that's the gear lever. Okay. I think so, but uh, what's the clutch for? When you put your foot down on the clutch, you can change gear. Ah. Now, uh, start the car. Uh, make sure it's in neutral first. <laughs> All right. Now? Yes, go on. Like this? Yes. Now, switch off. Well, you didn't do too badly that time. Now, uh, try again. Put your foot on the accelerator and uh, press down a tiny bit. Yeah. Switch off again. Now for the gears. Uh, this is first... Up here. Mm -hmm. Seconds down, like this. And thirds up and to the right, like this. Mm -hmm. And fourth, straight down. Uh, don't worry about reverse just yet. My father's car didn't have a gear lever here. It was uh, up here. No, you mean on the steering column. Anyway, now try to start the car again. 
Uh, put it into first gear and move off. Uh, but first check your mirror and put on your right indicator. Uh, that's the lever there. Are you ready? Now. Starting out. Ooh, ooh, starting out. Chapter 16. Arthur buys a car. Did Arthur learn to drive? Probably not, you may think. But Mr. Taylor's hair didn't go completely white, and in fact, Arthur learnt to drive without too much difficulty. He did not take his driving test two or three times. He passed the very first time, six weeks after his first lesson. So now he needed a car, but he wanted a cheap one because he only had about 200 pounds. By now, Bruce was out of hospital and back at work. Bruce is a second-hand car salesman, by the way. He sells cars at Middleford Used Car Mart, just round the corner from the library. One Saturday afternoon, Arthur put his checkbook into his pocket and caught a bus to the high street. He wanted to have a look at some good second-hand cars. He got off the bus at the police station and crossed the road to the car mart. There was a yellow sports car outside the showroom with the following information on the windscreen. This week's bargain. One careful owner, low mileage, 1978, MOT, radio, many extras. £200 deposit, three years to pay. Arthur looked at it for a long time. It was bright and shiny. The paint looked new. I need a car like that, thought Arthur. I may have enough money for the deposit next month. Hello, Arthur. So you passed your test. Congratulations. So, now you need a car, don't you? Mm. What do you think of that one? I must say it looks very nice. May I get in and start the engine? Of course. The key's in there. Beautiful, isn't it? Nothing wrong with that, is there? The only thing is that the price is a bit high. I've only got about £200 at the moment, but it's payday again soon. Well, that's out of the question, then. The insurance alone on this car comes to about £200 a year. And then there's the road tax. That's another £85. Bit too much for you, perhaps. Yes, I suppose so. Yes, you're right. It is a little too much for me, I'm afraid. May I look at something else? Yes, yeah, certainly, Arthur. We've got one or two inside. Come and have a look. What about that one over there? Uh. Ah, I can see you've got good taste. That's only £3,500. Not for you, really, is it? Mm, I suppose not. I haven't got that much in my pocket today. Never mind. What about this one instead? £150 deposit, three years to pay. How much are the monthly instalments? I may just have enough. About £50 a month, I should think. Oh, uh, well, I see. What else have you got? Well, we don't give cars away, you know. But I think we may have something suitable for you. Come on round the back for a moment. Now, what about this one here? I can let you have this for... 300 pounds, as it's you, Arthur. 75 pounds deposit? How old is it? It looks a bit scruffy. What can you expect for 300 pounds? It goes well, that's the main thing. It, uh, belonged to our mechanic, and he's looked after it really well. Charlie! Mob here a minute. You want to buy that, do you? You've got a bargain there, sir. Why not drive it round the block? Oh, thanks. That's a good idea. Well, Charlie, we may get rid of that heap of junk with a bit of luck. Don't forget, it was your car, and you looked after it personally. Uh, I'll get it.
Yes, it doesn't seem too bad. It goes all right. I'll take it. Yeah. Oh. Uh, oh. <laughs> Very good. Uh, Chapter 17. Arthur goes for a drive. So Arthur now has a car. It isn't a very magnificent one, but it seems to go all right. It's Thursday afternoon, and Arthur is working in the library. Tomorrow evening he will start his two weeks holiday, and will drive down to Applefield to stay with his family. He has no money left to go anywhere else. He needn't go by train this time. He needn't spend money on fares, but he must, of course, buy petrol. Mr. Steele has gone home early today, and there aren't many people in the library. So Arthur's sitting behind the desk, and he's thinking, This evening I shall clean the car, check the tyres, fill up the radiator, and put some distilled water into the battery. Then I shall get four gallons of petrol. How long will it take to drive to Applefield, I wonder? It's only about 40 miles, so it won't take more than an hour and a half. So I shall arrive home at about 8.30. They'll all be surprised to see me with a car, won't they? <laughs> it's a pity Mary isn't coming. She'll be with Bruce, I suppose. Oh, well, never mind. Perhaps I'll take Jennifer to the seaside on Sunday. So Arthur drove down to Applefield on Friday night, and on Saturday morning he was in the village shop. There he met Sheila. She was at her aunt's again, and was very pleased to see Arthur. He told her about his new car. On Sunday, Arthur took Jennifer and Sheila to Swanage for the day. They stopped and looked at Corfe Castle, about five miles outside Swanage. It's a fantastic castle, isn't it? Yes, it is. I like old castles, don't you, Arthur? Yes, I do. Come on, you two. Hurry up. We'll get to Swanage at midnight at this rate. All right, all right, we're coming. Huh. Now, where did we put the car? Oh, I remember. It's round the corner, isn't it? It's by that pub. By the way, shall we have lunch there? No, come on, or we'll have no time at the seaside. Let's go straight on. Well, open the doors, for goodness sake, Arthur. Huh? Wake up. Shall I sit in front now? No, I'll sit in front because I'm navigating. Oh. Arthur will never find the way on his own. Yes, that's right. It's left and then straight on up that hill. And by the way, look at your petrol gauge. We'll need some petrol in a minute. No, we won't. That petrol gauge doesn't work. Oh, how much did you pay for this car? Well, personally, I think it's a very nice car. It's a lovely colour. Look, it says Swanage, two miles. We'll soon be there now. Thank God for that. I'll be really glad to get out of this old wreck. Well, why did you come then? Oh, look, there's the sea. Doesn't it look lovely? I'm dying for a swim, aren't you, Arthur? I'm a bit hungry, actually. What about having lunch first? That's the first sensible thing you've said today. We'll have lunch at the ship in the square. It's just round the corner here. Where shall I park? Hmm. It says car park full, and there are yellow lines on this street. I mustn't park here. It's Sunday, you idiot. It doesn't count. All right, I'll park here. Let's go. Oh, I enjoyed that meal. Didn't you, Arthur? Yes, it was good. Here. Where's the car? It's gone. Oh, oh no. no. Starting out, ooh, ooh, starting now. Chapter 18. At the Races. In England, 
double yellow lines at the edge of the road may mean no parking at any time. Arthur's car was at the police station. So while Sheila and Jennifer went for a swim, Arthur went round to the police station and collected his car. He had to pay forty pounds, and the policeman on duty said one of his tyres was worn almost smooth. This was illegal. Arthur had to buy a new one that day. And so Arthur had less money for the rest of his holidays. The Sunday trip was more expensive than he first thought. On the way home, Jennifer was even more unpleasant than before. The traffic was worse on the way back. On Sunday evenings in the summer, the traffic is always heavier than usual. In fact, it's the worst time of the week. Sometimes they went no faster than five miles an hour, and in some places they went even more slowly. When they passed Salisbury, however, conditions were better but they didn't arrive home until after midnight, much later than they expected. Arthur didn't do much for the rest of his holidays. He spent a lot of time working on his car. He bought some paint, and at the end of the week it was cleaner, brighter, and more attractive than it was before. Jennifer's friend Bob, the engineering student from Reading University, knows a lot more about cars than most people in Applefield and he came round to the Newtons on several evenings and helped Arthur. They did all the necessary jobs, and finally the car worked much better. On his last Saturday at home, Arthur, Jennifer, Bob and Sheila went to a race meeting at Fetlock Park near Applefield. You know all about horses, don't you, Bob? Arthur doesn't know anything about them. I like that nice black one over there. His coat's smoother, and he's got a sweeter face than all the rest. Has he ever won a race? Let's see. Uh, that's Mark Time. No, he's never won a race in his life. Don't put any money on him. I've got a race card here, and Bright Thursday seems to be the best bet. Yes, he's the favourite. Ah. That's him over there, the grey one. He's bigger than the others, and faster, of course. And the jockey's tiny. Look at that one. He's smaller than me. Of course he is. Most people are smaller than her. Shut up, Jennifer. Don't be rude. I don't think she heard. Well, have you decided anything yet? Um, are you going to put any money on this race? If so, I'll go and put it on for you. I'm going to put a pound on Mark Time. He's the nicest horse I've ever seen. He looks sad. He's a bit like you, Arthur. I expect he's as slow as Arthur as well. Jennifer, you're the rudest girl I've ever met. I like darling Mary. I'm going to put my last two pounds on her. Do you hear that, Sheila? Arthur likes darling Mary. <laughs> oh. What are you going to put your money on, Jennifer? I haven't got any money. Come on, Arthur. Where's your money? Mm. We haven't got much time. Here you are. Let's go over there. We can see the race better there. Thursday. You haven't got much farther to go. I can't see my horse. I can. It's right at the back. It's the slowest horse in the race. Look at darling Mary. She's going faster now. She's just passing bright Thursday. She's going to win. Come on. Faster. Faster. Ah, look. She's won. Congratulations, Arthur. Chapter 19. The Football Match. So Arthur was lucky for once. The odds on Darling Mary were ten to one. If you put a pound on a horse at ten to one, you win ten pounds and you get your original pound back too. So Arthur went back to Middleford a little bit richer. One day during his first week at work after his holidays, Sheila's brother Michael came into the library to borrow a book about soccer. In England there are two kinds of football. Rugby football or rugger, and association football or soccer. Michael is a keen supporter of Middleford Rangers, the local football club. 
He goes to watch them every week during the soccer season if they are playing at home. He sometimes watches them play away if the match isn't too far from Middleford. Michael had a spare ticket for Saturday's home match against Didcot United. Arthur, as you can imagine, is not a great sportsman. But he had nothing to do that Saturday, so he accepted Michael's invitation to go with him. Middleford Rangers was not the best team in the football league. In fact, it was the worst. It was near the bottom of the fourth division. But this season, they had a new centre-forward, Fred Merton. He came from Neesden Rovers, a club at the top of the second division. In the first six matches of the season, he scored ten goals for his new club. So Arthur met Michael outside the ground at a quarter to three on Saturday, a quarter of an hour before the kick-off. They went through the turnstile and walked up to their seats in the stand. It's very crowded today, isn't it? Well, this is a local derby, of course, and there are a lot of Didcot supporters here. Those people in red and white scarves are the Didcot chaps. I suppose if you think about it, I'm a Didcot supporter, really. Didcot's nearer to Applefield than Middleford is. Don't talk so loud, then. Huh? If you say that too loud in this part of the ground, you'll be a bit unpopular. Oh, they're coming out now. Yes. That's Fred Merton over there, the one with the long hair and the beard. Fred, 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 the crowd Fred. seems to like him. Why is that? Well, if you score ten goals in six matches, you're the local hero. What are they doing now? Uh, the referee and the two captains are tossing up to see who's going to kick off and who's going to play at which end. Oh. Good. Now they're kicking off. Middlefold score is the one nearest to us. I suppose the Didcot team is the one in the red shirts and white shorts. Yes. And Middleford are all in white today. What's happened now? That Didcot chap's rolling about on the ground. And the referee's writing something in his little book. That means Fred's in trouble. Quite right, too. I saw him. He kicked that Didcot player deliberately. What did you say, mate? I was talking to my friend, actually. What did you say about our friend? Well, he kicked that poor chap. It was a deliberate foul. Say that again. It was a deliberate foul. <laughs> oh, 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 my eye. Starting out. Ooh, ooh, starting out. Chapter 20. A Brief Moment of Joy. So Arthur got a black eye. He didn't go to many football matches after that. In any case, he often had to work in the library on a Saturday afternoon. However, Arthur didn't lose interest in football completely. Every week, Arthur received a coupon by post for the football pools. Every Thursday, he sat in Mrs. Harrison's sitting room and filled his coupon in. One Saturday, while Arthur was working in the library, he took his small transistor radio out of his pocket and switched it on very low to listen to the results and check the copy of his coupon. Mr. Steele was working in his office, and Arthur didn't want him to hear the radio. Radios aren't allowed in the library. Mary was also working in the library. She had to put some new books on the shelves. She was watching Arthur and noticed that he was getting very excited. Rinsford 1, Scumthorpe 2, Berry 0, Chester 0, Northampton 1, Colchester 1. Good. That's another score draw. Now I've got five. Scottish League Division 1. Arthur, what are you doing? Shut up a minute, Mary. East 5 0, Celtic 6, Dundee 1. Parts one. God, that's six so far. Turn that radio off. Mr. Steele's coming. To hell with Mr. Steele. Morton, two. Partick Thistle, two. Seven. One more to go. Arthur, what do you think you're doing? Turn that off at once. This is a library, you know. Motherwell, two. Rangers, three. Do you hear me? Quiet. What did you say? Oh, shut up. Hibernian, one. Air United, one. That's it. I've got it. I've won the pool! Arthur, stop talking nonsense. Are you completely mad? Mr. 
Mr. Steele is absolutely furious. He was getting redder and redder while you were being rude to him. You'll have to apologize. Oh, forget Mr. Steele. I don't have to work here ever again. <laughs> I'm rich. We won't have to worry about old Steele anymore. Come on, put your coat on. We're going to celebrate. But Arthur, the library doesn't close for another 20 minutes. Don't you understand? We're rich. You may be, but I'm not. Oh, Mary, don't you see? We can... Oh, no. Just a minute. What's this in my pocket? Oh, no. It's the pool's envelope. I forgot to post it. Arthur, will you come into my office? Yes, Mr. Steele. I'm coming. You see... I thought... Starting out, ooh, starting out. That's the end of Access to English, Starting Out, by Michael Coles and Basil Lord. New edition, published 1984 by Oxford University Press. Copyright Oxford University Press, 1974 and 1984. Starting now.